Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob Chatburn. I'm uh, from the Cleveland Clinic. And today I'm going to share with you a lecture that was the second annual Robert Kaczmarek Memorial Lecture that I gave at the AARC Congress about two years ago. So if you weren't there, then this will be a kind of a nice treat for you. Uh, this is my conflict of interest statement. And by the way, all of these slides and a video will be available. I know I'm going to be presenting a lot of information. And so if you feel overwhelmed, don't be too worried because you can go back and review it anytime you want. So my objectives in this talk are first to explain how the rapidly increasing pace of technical innovations in mechanical ventilation has created knowledge gaps in communication problems. Um, I hope to convince you uh, that there is an urgent need for a standardized education program to help clinicians provide better care. And then finally, I will describe such a program developed at the Cleveland Clinic and which is currently free and open to the public. Okay, um, I want to begin with a tribute to Bob Kazmarek. He was my friend and colleague, and I worked with him at medical conferences all over the world, from Mexico to South America to Japan and across the United States. And I consider Bob to be the most influential respiratory therapist in the history of our profession. He was an exemplar in clinical practice, research, and especially education. And in fact, it was uh, the first time I met Bob was way back in the late 1970s when he was giving seminars on how to take the very first clinical simulation test for the NBRC registry exam. And if you check PubMed, I think that you will find that Bob has published more research articles than any other respiratory therapist in the history of the profession. In, the, in addition, he is the author of several textbooks, most notably Fundamentals of Respiratory Care used by more programs than any other general textbook uh, on the subject. As a lead into this lecture, it is important to note that Way back in 2007, Bob was part of an AARC task force to envision the respiratory therapist of the future. Bob was the lead author on a paper describing the task force that appeared in Respiratory Care Journal in 2009. As the paper says, the goal was to identify potential new roles and responsibilities for RTs in 2015 and beyond. And needless to say, we are way beyond that now. And um, let's see how those, those roles and responsibilities played out. More importantly for this talk, Bob followed up with a paper describing his vision of the competencies of future RTs in the area of mechanical ventilation. Specifically, he said that RTs must be technical experts on every aspect of the mechanical ventilator, be able to compare capabilities of ventilators, be skilled in ventilator waveform analysis, know in detail the action of all modes and adjuncts. And now I want you to consider if you think this is a noble vision for our profession. You know, if we were in live, I'd say, raise your hands, whoever you think that is. Now, who of you thinks that this is actually an achievable goal? And more to a point, just how could such a goal be achieved? Unfortunately, Bob's paper provided no guidance in this regard, hence topic of this lecture. These are the things that Bob said we need to be doing. Again, is this a noble vision and is this an achievable goal? Um, to begin with, uh, let's consider how advances in ventilator technology have created a huge educational problem. Way back when I was in school in the last century, okay, the very first book on respiratory care mentioned only three modes of mechanical ventilation. Indeed, only a few ventilators in those days, like the one shown here, actually had knobs with mode labels. Nobody gave any thought to what names were used to identify modes, and that attitude has continued to the present day to a large extent. Fast forward to today, the most recent respiratory care book uh, 
list um, unique modes, no, names of modes on 55 different ventilators. And it is not uncommon for ICU ventilators to have dozens of modes. Indeed, on one ventilator, I counted 75 different names of modes, while the ventilator's operator's manual only identified 16. So even though there are hundreds of names of modes, that doesn't mean that there are hundreds of different modes. In this textbook, which classifies all modes on ventilators according to a formal taxonomy, which we will discuss, there are only about 75 unique modes. A taxonomy is a classification system. And I intend to convince you that this is the first step in bridging the knowledge gap created by advanced technology. To begin with, we need an appreciation of just how the complexity of ventilator technology has increased over the last half century. The first generation of popular mechanical ventilators before the 1980s were mostly non-invasive devices like the iron lung, whose success was driven by the polio epidemic. Around the time of the creation of intensive care units in the, in the United States, I think it was in the 60s or 70s, the second generation of commercially popular ventilators arose that offered only one or two modes. This was true of both the adult and the pediatric ICU ventilators. And then as microprocessors became available in uh, the 1990s, uh, digitally controlled uh, ventilators appeared that had a variety of modes in the third generation. Inexpensive digital displays led to the fourth generation ventilators with integrated graphical displays. The fifth generation gave us ventilators with multiple microprocessors and virtual instrument interfaces. Currently, the sixth generation of ventilators provides as many as I said, 75 different modes on a single device with advanced control monitoring and graphics capabilities, including the use of artificial intelligence, esophageal pressure monitoring and volumetric capnography. We can see that over this period, the technological complexity of mechanical ventilators has grown exponentially. Unfortunately, the educational resources developed to teach mechanical ventilation have not kept pace. As a result, there's a growing knowledge gap on the part of clinicians charged with managing mechanical ventilation. This gap greatly affects patient safety, healthcare cost, and clinician confidence. Clearly, we have an ever-increasing problem that profoundly affects patient care and our ability to contribute as healthcare providers. I am suggesting that we need a new educational paradigm. This new paradigm is represented by a pyramid of skills that the clinician needs to know to be expert in the technology of mechanical ventilation. Indeed, it summarizes the need for a taxonomy classifying modes of ventilation based on fundamental principles of physics and mathematics. Now, the idea is that you are expected to be able to use all modes, but before that, you have to be able to understand, compare, and contrast, and recommend all the modes that are available to you. And before that, you have to be able to recognize and classify all those modes. To do that, you must have the fundamental understanding of 10 basic maxims of mechanical ventilation that we will go over. And before anything else, like any new uh, skill, you have to memorize the definitions of the terms that are used to create the 10 maxims. Uh, that are basically the foundation of the understanding of how ventilators work. Note that this pyramid just addresses the technology of mechanical ventilation and not the practice. Think of it as learning how to read music and play notes on a musical instrument. Using a ventilator, like playing music, is related, but not a, but is a fundamentally different topic. Okay, some of you may be wondering why the need for this paradigm. Doesn't that just make things more complicated? Well, let's use a simple analogy. Suppose you do a search for headache medicines. Google, Google provides three options without qualification, as if they were somehow equivalent. They all have different brand names, which do nothing to inform you. This is analogous to how a ventilator offers a list of modes, uh, but you know that drugs have different generic names. 
So you look on the label and you find that one brand is actually a mixture of three different drugs. One uh, has two and one is just a, a simple pure drug. And furthermore, the label actually gives you the drug classification as a pain reliever, reliever in addition to the generic name. Now imagine a world where there were no generic names for thousands of different brand names of drugs. If you were responsible for using drugs for patient care, you would have necessity be limited to a small number of drugs and would find it difficult to add new drugs to your toolbox. Well, that's exactly where we stand with hundreds of brand names of modes of ventilation. Most clinicians are simply not aware of the mode taxonomy, and so naturally they understand and use only a small number of them. Now, Google says there are over 3 billion different medicines in different categories. The world of pharmacology has dealt with this complexity in three steps. First is to create a taxonomy to classify types of drugs and distinguish among arbitrary brand names. Second is to create a science of pharmacodynamics to describe the physiological effects of different drugs. And third, there is the study of pharmacokinetics to understand how the body interacts with drugs. While 500 mode names pales in comparison to 3 billion drug names, certainly the same need for organization is evident. Therefore, the first step would be to create a taxonomy or classification system for names of modes, brand names of modes. This helps us to distinguish which ones are the same and which ones are different among all the different brand names. Second, we can create a system of concepts to help us understand the general design principles of ventilators as the basis for this taxonomy. And then third, we can create another taxonomy for describing the physics of patient ventilator interactions in terms of synchrony versus discordance. This approach can be the basis of a standardized educational approach to mechanical ventilation. And by the way, Standardized educational programs are essential for things like CPR, BLS, and ALS training in medicine. They are standardized because lives depend on proper technique. We should think no less of mechanical ventilation. Yet, physicians and nurses are not taught this subject in universities. And you cannot find two RT programs in the same city even that teach the subject in the same way, despite using the same textbooks. So now is the time to unveil the educational solution we created at the Cleveland Clinic. It is called uh, the SAVA program. SAVA stands for Standardized Education for Ventilatory Assistance. And by the way, it is also a Sanskrit word that means selfless service. SAVA was conceived and developed by Dr. Eduardo Morales Cabotavilla and me at the Cleveland Clinic. Many other physicians and respiratory therapists have contributed contributed to it over the last decade. Now, the vision for SEVA is to provide a unique platform for standardized training by unifying the concepts of physics, physiology, and technology of mechanical ventilation. The mission is to use both online and in-person simulation-based instruction that has both self-directed and instructor-led components to elevate the skills of healthcare providers to the mastery level. We believe that standardized education will yield better understanding of current and future ventilation technology. Better understanding will lead to better application of all ventilators and modes, as well as related monitoring tools. Better education will lead to better communication amongst caregivers, better orders and charting and medical records and more efficient decision-making. At the bedside. And of course, the ultimate motivation is better patient care, including shorter duration of ventilation and fewer adverse events. The roots of the taxonomy for modes of ventilation can be traced back to the early 1990s when I was writing a textbook on respiratory care equipment. But the formal birth was with this paper published in Respiratory Care in 2012, entitled Determining the Basis for a Taxonomy of Mechanical Ventilation. Believe it or not, it was adopted as my master's thesis. We follow this paper with a complete description of the mode taxonomy founded on 10 
fundamental maxims. These maxims are the basic concepts required to understand the design and function of ventilators and the classification of modes. These concepts are the theoretical framework upon which the taxonomy is built. Of course, being able to identify, identify modes is only one level of skill. Ultimately, we need to be able to assess the patient's needs and support them with the most appropriate mode. This paper provided for the first time a rational theory for selecting modes basis, based on how well their technical features serve the three goals of ventilation. These goals were described as safety, meaning adequate gas exchange and lung protection, comfort, meaning maximum patient ventilator synchrony, and liberation, meaning minimized duration of, dur of mechanical ventilation. Um, most recently, we have created another taxonomy for patient ventilator interactions to unify the clinical and research observations of future studies and educational materials. Over the past years, over the past 10 years, I should say, or more, the fundamental concepts of SEVA have been adopted without modification by nearly every textbook on mechanical ventilation and general respiratory care. This infrastructure provides educators a practical means of standardizing education across many different teaching venues. This system has also been adopted by ECRI as a means of fair comparison of modes among different ventilator brands. Their reports are used by hospitals when making purchase decisions. Now, some of you are old enough to remember this classic TV commercial. And now you want to know what SAVA delivers in the form of educational content. The SAVA program is a progressive system of six sequential courses, starting from an assumption of no prior knowledge to full mastery of advanced techniques. Physicians in the pulmonary and critical care fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic are required to take these courses. So far, the first three courses are free and open to the public. And the last uh, three are only available at the Cleveland Clinic uh, to employees. And we are working on a means to open up these classes to the public also. The first course is called SAVA Basic and is a short self-directed online course that introduces the main concepts from subsequent courses. It contains simple versions of the material found in SAVA Theory and SAVA Team. Uh, taxonomies are based on what is called a standardized vocabularies, specific to uh, each knowledge domain. SAVA basic students are given a glossary comprised of all relevant terms used in the taxonomy and otherwise related to mechanical ventilation. To gain a better understanding of these key terms, we need a model of the respiratory system. A model is basically a system of components that in some way represents a more complex system. In this case, we need to represent the complex systems of airways and lung units was something that is much simpler and easier to understand. The most common model for this purpose is what is a single compartment model of the respiratory system. It is called a single compartment model because it is comprised of a single flow conducting tube representing the airways and a single elastic compartment representing the lungs and the chest wall. The utility of this model is that we can make measurements of only three variables, pressure, volume, and flow, and use them to describe the mechanical properties that are useful for understanding both patient physiology and patient ventilator interaction. There are two basic mechanical properties of interest for understanding mechanical ventilation. The first is resistance, defined as the ratio of pressure change to flow change. The second is elastance, defined as the ratio of pressure change to volume change. Compliance, defined as the reciprocal of elastance, is often used instead of elastance. The student needs to memorize the simple equations for resistance, elastance, and compliance. Note that this model can take several forms. It can be graphical, like the drawing in this slide. It can be physical, like an actual tube attached to an elastic container, the classic straw and balloon model, or it can be mathematical. In other words, expressed in terms of pressure, volume, and flow, is functions of time. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
This course introduces the basic mode taxonomy as a classification convention having three components. These components are the control variable, the breath sequence, and the targeting scheme. The control variable divides all modes into two classes, volume control and pressure control. The breath sequence is what distinguishes modes on the basis of the pattern of mandatory and spontaneous deaths. This gives us a precise way of describing modes with names like volume AC, pressure SIMV, and pressure support. The targeting scheme is essentially the software algorithm that makes the mode unique. Even though there are dozens of unique modes, there are only seven targeting schemes, a number that can be easily memorized. Save a basic course introduced to the idea of rational mode selection. It begins by assessing the goal of ventilation in terms of safety, comfort, and liberation. Only one goal will predominate at any point in time for a given patient. After that, the clinician simply selects the available mode with the most features to serve the goal. That's simple enough. Save a basic uh, course also introduces the concept, concepts needed later in Save a Team to interpret ventilator waveforms and assess patient ventilator interactions. Save a Theory is an advanced course on the vocabulary and physics required to understand the mode taxonomy. A version of this course is currently taught online at Youngstown State University in the master's level respiratory care program. And also I think it's used in the bachelor's level as well. The first three courses in, SAVA, in the SAVA program are available free online through Cleveland Clinic's learning management system called MyLearning. This is an example of what the SAVA theory dashboard looks like. SAVA theory uh, begins with an introduction to the AIM before you ACT rubric. A stands for assessment of patient ventilation needs in terms of safety, comfort, and liberation. I stands for <clears throat> identifying the technical capabilities of the modes available to you to use. And M stands for matching the available technology uh, to meet patient needs. AC stands for applying considered technology. These are the 10 maxims that are listed in the form of the uh, basic save the theory course. I will briefly review each one. Maximum one defines a breath the way a ventilator does in terms of the flow time waveform. Because the horizontal axis is time, we can define various periods that are important relative to ventilator settings. Maximum two defines the assisted breath and distinguishes it from unassisted and loaded breaths. Because a ventilator is defined as an automatic machine that performs some portion of the work of breathing, this maxim briefly reviews the definition of work, both in mathematical and in graphical terms. Maxim three defines control variables based on the mathematical model called the equation of motion for the respiratory system. This model was built into every ventilator and ventilator waveforms are nothing more than graphics of this equation. Saver theory relies heavily on the use of this model. Although this is a differential equation re requiring the skills in calculus to fully appreciate, the course provides an intuitive understanding and practical applications. Nothing more than high school algebra is required to pass the course. The equation of motion is the theoretical basis for defining pressure control and volume control modes of mechanical ventilation. The ventilator can only control one side of the equation at a time. Pressure control means that the ventilator is controlling the left-hand side of the equation. That is, pressure is either maintained at a constant target value, or it is automatically adjusted to be proportional to the patient's inspiratory effort. Changes in elastance and resistance cause changes in volume and flow. As the operator, you either set the inspiratory target pressure or the constant of proportionality between PVENT and PMUS in modes like NAVA and PAP. On the other hand, volume control means that the ventilator controls the right-hand side of the equation. This means that both tidal volume and peak inspiratory flow are preset. Therefore, changes in elastance and resistance cause changes in the pressure waveform only. 
The equation of motion is introduced as the theoretical basis for waveform interpretation. It explains the effects of changes in mechanics on the pressure, volume, and flow waveforms. Here we, see, here we see the effects of inspiratory effort on the pressure waveform during volume control. In contrast, these are the effects of inspiratory effort during pressure control ventilation. A key concept in the understanding of ventilator waveforms is the idea of a time constant. The time constant is a characteristic of exponential curves as seen in the inspiratory volume and flow waveforms during pressure control. The time constant is calculated by multiplying resistance by compliance with the resulting units of time, usually seconds. In a unit of time equal to one time constant, an exponential curve will change by 63%. This is important for determining whether volume and flow curves represent normal or abnormal respiratory system mechanics. A rule of thumb is that a long time constant generally means an increased resistance, whereas a short time constant usually means a decreased compliance. The first step in identifying the mode is to memorize the shapes of the basic pressure, volume, and flow waveforms for volume control and pressure control. The equation of motion defines elastic and resistive loads of the respiratory system and relates them to the shapes of the pressure waveforms during volume or pressure control ventilation. Maxim 4 defines trigger and cycle events. The start of inspiration is called the trigger event, and the ventilator monitors a trigger variable like time or pressure or flow, and it starts inspiration when the variable reaches a preset threshold. The threshold value is determined by the sensitivity setting. Maxim 5 builds on Maxim 4 by indicating the possible ways that breaths can be triggered or cycled by the machine or the patient. Maxim 6 applies Maxim 4 and 5 by defining spontaneous and mandatory breaths in terms of trigger and cycle events. Now, this is a key concept because it is at the heart of the mode taxonomy. And it is often misrepresented in the literature and also by ventilator manufacturers. So in other words, memorize what you see here and forget what you've been taught. <laughs> Maxim 7 starts the construction of the mode taxonomy by defining breath sequences. There are three different kinds of breath sequences, continuous mandatory ventilation, intermittent mandatory ventilation, and continuous spontaneous ventilation. The three breath sequences, CMV, IMV, and CSV, are key concepts in the mode taxonomy. Now, this is important. There are four different types of IMV. A concept that we recently described in the paper in Respiratory Care Journal, but virtually ignored by all other published uh, papers on mechanical ventilation and even textbooks. But without an understanding of these types, it is simply not possible to appreciate the evolution of modes from simp simple manually adjusted types to more and more automatic varieties. Maxim 8 is simple but fundamental. It says that if you can bind the control variable with the breath sequence, you get five basic ventilatory patterns found on all ventilators. These are volume control, CMV, and IMV, plus pressure control, CMV, IMV, and CSV. Volume control, CSV, is not possible because volume control implies machine cycling, so there can never be a volume control spontaneous breath. Maxim 9 describes in detail the seven different targeting schemes that um, make uh, modes unique in their abilities to serve the goals of mechanical ventilation. They differ mainly in the level of automation that they use in adjusting ventilator settings. Students will have to memorize these definitions if they want to fully understand and use the mode taxonomy. I'll briefly go over the seven targeting schemes. We don't have much time to go into them in detail, but to say that probably the first and most commonly used targeting scheme is set point. Uh, it's abbreviated with a lowercase s, and it means that all the targets are operator preset. Dual targeting 
means the ventilator can automatically switch between volume control and pressure control within a single breath. Remember that you can only ever be in one or the other, either volume control or pressure control. But nowadays, ventilators can switch rapidly during a breath or even between breaths. Biovariable means that the ventilator randomly changes the inspiratory pressure and hence tidal volume to mimic normal breathing. Servo targeting means that inspiratory pressure is automatically adjusted to be proportional to inspiratory effort. In effect, P-Vent is used to amplify P-Mus, similar to the way power steering works in a car. Adaptive targeting means that the ventilator automatically adjusts the inspiratory pressure as lung mechanics change to achieve an average tidal volume equal to the preset target. This means, for example, that inspiratory pressure decreases as compliance increases or inspiratory effort increases. In fact, the ventilator can't tell the difference between increased compliance and increased effort. Optimal targeting means that the ventilator uses adaptive targeting to select both an inspiratory pressure and frequency for mandatory breaths that minimizes the power transfer from the ventilator to the respiratory system. Optimal targeting is in fact the way the brain controls the ventilatory pattern to minimize caloric expenditure during normal breathing. Recent research suggests that minimizing power transfer may decrease the risk of ventilator-induced lung injury. Intelligent targeting schemes use the tools of artificial intelligence, such as mathematical models, fuzzy logic, rule-based expert system, and of course, artificial neural networks. The most advanced form of this scheme is called IntelliVent and can automatically select tidal volume, frequency, PEEP, and FiO2 while enforcing rules for lung protective ventilation. Maxim 10 demonstrates the full mode taxonomy based on the previous maxims. Mode classification is a simple three-step process. Step one is to identify the control variable based on our knowledge of maxim three and the equation of motion. Step two is to identify the breath sequence based on our knowledge of maxim seven. Step three is to identify the targeting schemes used for both primary and secondary breaths based on our knowledge of maxim nine. Perhaps the most common mode used in the world is what is often called volume assist control. Just as an example, the first step in classifying this mode is to note that the operator sets both tidal volume and inspiratory flow. This is the definition of volume control. Next, we note that every patient trigger effort results in a volume cycled breath. Volume cycling is machine cycling. For maximum six, from maximum six, we know that a machine cycled inspiration is one criterion for a mandatory breath. Hence, we know the breath sequence is continuous mandatory ventilation, CMV. For step three, we note that all targets are operator set. There is no automatic control of targets. Hence, the targeting scheme is set point. We'll, we will bring all this information together in the mode abbreviation or tag. In this case, VC indicates volume control, CMV indicates continuous mandatory ventilation, and the lowercase s represents set point targeting scheme. Here's another example for the mode called bi-level ventilation. In this case, the breath sequence is IMV, for which we have both mandatory and spontaneous breaths. For that reason, we need at least two abbreviations for the targeting schemes. Thus, the first S represents set point targeting for mandatory breaths, and the second S represents set point targeting for spontaneous breaths. Here is another IMV mode, but this time with adaptive targeting for mandatory breaths and set point targeting for spontaneous breaths. Here is an example of a CSV mode. In this example, automatic tube compensation is added to CPAP to create a mode using the servo targeting scheme. As it turns out, both NAVA and PAV have the same tag, PCCSVR. They're just different varieties of this 
category in the same way you can have different variety of roses under the same um, species. Now the next course in SAVA is SAVA Lab, and it is a simulated ventilator laboratory exercise. It is based on a software patient ventilator simulator that runs in Microsoft Excel on any computer. Learners use a laboratory style notebook to predict the effects of changes in ventilator settings or lung mechanics on ventilator waveforms. The predictions are then tested using the simulator. This is the interface for the patient ventilator simulator used in the SAVA lab course. This is what you'd see on your computer if you're running it in Excel. On the left are navigation buttons that allow selection of modes along with a glossary of terms and a wealth of additional educational resources. On the right, we see how lung mechanics and ventilator settings are adjusted and how they affect ventilator waveforms. The simulator is unique in that it also shows the waveform distortion effects of inspiratory effort. This is something you won't see on any ventilator. This training is a valuable foundation for the later courses in which actual ventilator screenshots are analyzed. Now, for example, this shows the pressure, volume, and flow waveforms for volume control using a descending ramp flow waveform. The lung mechanics are set to represent moderate ARDS in a passive patient. Here's the same patient, with a con but with a constant inspiratory flow. Here is the same patient, but with a moderate inspiratory effort, represented by PMUS curve, shown in red. PMUS is something you never see directly on a ventilator waveform. This example shows how PMUS distorts PVENT in volume control. Here's the same patient, but making an inspiratory effort after machine trigger event. This is a specific patient ventilator synchrony problem called early triggering, but also known as reverse triggering in the literature. This is a demonstration of another synchrony problem called early cycling. Note that the patient's neural inspiratory time, represented by the red P mus curve, extends beyond the set inspiratory time. The classic sign is a distorted peak expiratory flow. Here is an example of how PMUS can distort inspiratory flow and volume waveforms in pressure control. Now, SAVA team, which we now have changed the name to SAVA method, is a unique team-based learning experience. There are also four short videos that are required viewing prior to the class. Uh, this course reviews the material in SAVA theory and then shows the application the patient assessment and mode selection. It also applies what the patient, what the student learned in the previous courses to advanced ventilator graphics interpretation and patient ventilator synchrony analysis. SAVA team provides the concepts for applying theory in clinical practice. It introduces the idea that there are only three goals of mechanical ventilation, safety, comfort, and liberation. Once the goal has been identified, the appropriate mode is selected based on this te technological capabilities to serve the goal. In other words, whatever goal has the most technical capabilities to serve that particular um, uh, goal at that particular time, time is most appropriate. And these are just examples of modes. These are not necessarily the only ones you can pick. In fact, learners are given pocket cards that give the names of modes of ventilation found on vents loosed, in this case at the Cleveland Clinic, but are fairly common throughout the world. There's also a card that helps the clinician to select the best mode based on the primary clinical goal. Modes shaded in green are recommended. Modes in, those in yellow are to be used with caution, and those modes in red are not recommended. Note that the modes are listed as generic tags, so the recommendations are independent of ventilator brands. SAVA team poses questions regarding SAVA, uh, regarding waveform interpretations based on ideas presented in SAVA theory. The team comes to consensus and then answers are discussed. This is what a SAVA team session looks like and conducted in person. Groups of three to five clinicians from different professions make up the teams. Active discussion of exercise questions makes this a fun and engaging event. Save a team can be also conducted online 
which is what we did during the COVID pandemic. Seva Sim, which has now been changed to Seva Opt Event, takes place at a simulation center and uses standard mannequins as well as state-of-the-art breathing simulators. There are also three short videos that are required viewing prior to the class. The course provides three clinical scenarios to teach the skills of ventilating patients recovering from anesthesia, with severe obstructive disease, and with severe restrictive disease. Save a Sim is an instructor-led experience that follows precise decision-making algorithms. This approach ensures consistency among different instructors and overall quality of the course. Save a Sim takes place at a simulation center where ICU beds and mannequins can be used for realistic clinical scenarios. Save a Master, which we now call Save a Monitor, is the final course that brings learners to the mastery level by training them on specialized procedures in a simulation center environment. These procedures include monitoring with esophageal pressure catheters and volumetric capnography. The course also teaches the skills to evaluate and treat work of breathing issues, as well as weaning procedures. Advanced modes such as NAVA, PAV, and ASV are also demonstrated. Save a Master teaches the practical applications of esophageal pressure monitoring using either a standard patient monitor for blood pressure adapted to the esophageal catheter uh, or specialized ventilator capabilities. So many ventilators nowadays have a separate pressure port for esophageal pressure. This course also teaches volumetric capnography using either standalone monitors or specially equipped ventilators. The master course also covers um, recruitment maneuvers and the use of pressure volume curves to determine optimal settings for tidal volume and PEEP. Uh, if you are interested in taking these courses, please feel free to use the link in the slide. You will need to create a free account at the Cleveland Clinic Learning Management System called MyLearning. The SAVA education program has led to two major spinoff projects. The first spinoff is a bi-weekly online interactive discussion led by our ICU director, Dr. Morellis Cabagavilla and me. Here we review the basic SAVA concepts and analyze actual screen shots from ventilators in the ICU. The format is a formal three-step process to identify the mode, the primary abnormality, such as resistance compliance or inspiratory effort, and then a thorough analysis of any patient ventilator synchrony issue. Event rounds is open to the public, and we have clinicians from all over the world participating. Viewers are encouraged to send in their unique screenshots for analysis. A key component of SABIT training is the use of the taxonomy of modes. And this taxonomy, as I mentioned before, is just as important as a taxonomy that gives up generic drug names. It is also has ramifications for entries into the electronic medical record. At Cleveland Clinic, we use EPIC. In EPIC, drug orders are entered by generic name, with example, brand names given in parentheses. Perhaps some of you use EPIC and are familiar with this. We have programmed EPIC to do the same thing for modes of ventilation. The generic mode classification is given first in the list of available modes, along with example brand names in parentheses. Furthermore, required settings are listed in context-sensitive menus so that only the settings applicable to the mode are seen. At least one other hospital has adopted this scheme, which is essential for future data mining. This one hospital's experience with using the ventilator mode taxonomy for charting in the electronic medical record was recently published in the journal Pediatric Pulmonology. The paper concluded that a standardized mechanical ventilation term terminology may facilitate efficient data, change, data exchange in a multi-site network. Rapid data sharing is necessary to improve research and clinical care. Finally, we have developed a phone app that is a database that names and classifies all the modes on virtually all of the ventilators used in the United States. 
This is an essential tool for comparing modes on different ventilators. It is one thing to provide advanced learning experiences, but the goal is behavior change and ultimately improved patient care. To sustain the educational advances of the SAVA program, we have developed a new system to maintain competency. We have partnered with a company called AutoLearn, which provides an adaptive learning platform to reinforce our training program and keep knowledge retention within a set mastery level standard. AutoLearn has was built to address two key challenges in organizational training. One is low learner engagement and two, poor knowledge retention. It uses the latest cognitive science theories, including gamification, deep encoding, and adaptive training. Learners engage with short personalized training experiences on their phones or computers. We have developed AutoLearn content by mapping our existing SAVA course content and optimizing it with adaptive learning. We have essentially uh, programmed our uh, SAVA basic content into AutoLearn and our next step will be to uh, input SAVA theory. AutoLearn features two modes, learning and training. For learning mode, the image on the left, users are directed to complete sessions where they are presented with searchable knowledge cards that feature long form content, including text, images, and other forms of media. In training mode, users are proactively nudged and presented with contextual activity questions for which they can earn points. These points can then be redeemed for various rewards and benefits. Gamification, in other words. Performance metrics are based on errors, self-reported confidence levels, and the time to answer the questions. A proprietary algorithm identifies knowledge gaps and then personalizes the training journey to mastery. AutoLearn provides detailed analytics. We will be able to see which learners are participating, which learners are in mastery, and which learners are struggling and re may require a few short training sessions to get back into the mastery level on a given topic. Okay, I want to close this lecture as I began it with appreciation for my friend, Bob Kazmarek. Hopefully we have done justice to his vision for achieving full competency and mechanical ventilation for current and future clinicians. May you all enjoy health and peace in the coming um, years, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>